The heat has finally arrived and us growers are in the thick of it now. For me, I know that we're into the meat of the season when my watermelons finally get planted outside, which is a big deal here in Canada because our summers are so short. This also coincides with a shift in our thinking as we go from planning and planting to troubleshooting and maintenance. For the most part, we've already planted what we want to grow, and now the focus is on seeing it and the harvest come to fruition. Not all planting is done though, and keen growers will intersperse quick crops here and there, maximizing all the space they have. For us, that means a ton of stuff to cover and no shortage of relevant video topics. So, in case you missed it, here's episodes 141 to 150 of the Garden Quickie. Enjoy. There's nothing more that I love than growing my own food. Crop after crop of delicious, nutritious goodness that knows no equal. But, despite loving it so much, there's a few crops that I'm simply not going to plant this year. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, you just can't grow everything. And today's episode is all about what I'm leaving out, what I'm not going to be growing this year. Specifically, five crops that didn't make the cut. Time short as it always is, so let's dive in. Past rewards don't guarantee future success. And after two years of mediocre results, the first crop to get the boot this year is cauliflower. A medium to sometimes long crop, this fruiting brassica is simply fantastic when you get it right. But with insanely hot summers and drought becoming the new norm, this guy just doesn't perform as well as it should. For this next one, we go with cauliflower's close cousin, both in proximity in my garden and genetics. That's right, Brussels sprouts. Love these guys and fresh from the garden is really the only way to eat them. But two years in a row of unreliable harvests means I gotta take a break. For this next one, we go underground giving us potatoes. Or should I say, not giving us potatoes, because we're not going to be growing any of them this year. It's actually pretty crazy, because I can't remember a single year where we didn't grow at least a few pounds of tasty taters. Heck, we even grew them inside at one point. But space, time, and a couple of years of low yields means that I'm shelving potatoes for at least this year. No question, nightshades are always high on the list for most gardeners. With tomatoes and peppers often being the hands down favorite. However, there's one nightshade that's going to be completely absent from my garden this year. I'm talking eggplant. A solid grower in my climate, I've never had any problem growing a ton of arborgines. It's just that we don't eat enough of them to warrant the space. So, maybe next year. And lastly, the fifth crop that won't be taking up any space in my garden this year are onions. Green onions, yes. Bulb onions, not this time. Don't get me wrong, I love fresh onions from the garden and I've pretty much perfected growing them in my area. It's just that it's a costly crop to grow in terms of space, time, and the effort versus what I could be growing instead. In my opinion, it's all about managing our growing windows and the best use of our resources. One of the best ways to do that is to be selective with the crops you grow. And of course, check out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. No doubt, rows and rows of amazing produce is impressive. As growers, it's what we strive for, and it's the goal for each and every crop. But within the vast array of plants at our disposal, there is a select few that do well in more intimate surroundings. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, there's nothing wrong with being intimate. And today's episode is all about container growing. 
More specifically, my top seven crops to grow in pots and containers this year. You know, originally it was supposed to be four, which quickly grew to five. Finally, I had to cap it at seven. So today we gotta use our time wisely. First up, we have carrots. As long as your container depth is at least a foot, you can grow most carrot varieties. And not only do they just survive, they thrive. Harvest to thin and stagger your crops all spring and summer and enjoy a near unlimited supply. Next, we've got lettuce. And I mean all kinds of lettuce. In fact, any leafy green is gonna work great in a container setup, but it's the lettuces that really shine, especially the upright romaine types. Look, I've even grown leaf lettuce in a hollowed out cantaloupe. So growing these guys in a container setup is almost too easy. At number three, we have a surprising favorite and that's garlic. I grow hundreds of garlic bulbs every year and the container plants keep up with the ones in the beds, no problem. Short, shallow root systems, garlic really does seem to appreciate the extra drainage. And it's one of the easiest container crops you're ever going to cultivate, despite the long growing time of up to nine months. Next up, we've got peas. You'll find that most varieties of peas are climbers with shallow roots. So, as long as they have space and support to grow upwards, they're going to love container life. Direct sower transplant, peas can also take the cold a lot better than most. At number five, we have the world's easiest crop, green onions. Seed these guys heavy for a forest of tastiness or grow the ends from grocery store cuttings just to get started. Green onions come back every year, even in containers. And if left to flower, they're going to attract pollinators like you wouldn't believe. Next, we have one of my favorite crops to grow in containers, and that's strawberries. With shallow root systems and low crawling growth habits, strawberries are just built from the ground up to live in containers. Trust me, being contained won't slow down their production one bit. And finally, we have the number one crop, not only for containers, but really for anything, tomatoes. These guys do absolutely fantastic in container setups, but make no mistake, they do need space. At least a seven gallon pot, preferably a 10 gallon one for all but the smallest varieties. Determinate cherry and grape ones are the best types to grow, but even large ones like this Roma here that need staking are totally on the menu. Container gardening. What a great way to use every piece of available space to grow some food. And for you patio growers, as your only option, it's a pretty darn good one. Now what else is pretty darn good? The next episode of The Garden Quickie. In gardening, there's rarely just a right way and a wrong way. It's almost never that black and white. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie. The show we're in two minutes or less, we're all about gardening success. And today's episode is all about direct seeding. More specifically, two different but equally awesome ways to do it. Time short as it always is, so let's dive in. In case you didn't know, or maybe you've never heard the term before, direct seeding is a planting practice of sowing seeds in the same location where those plants are going to complete their entire life cycle. In other words, no transplanting. Where you seed is where it grows. Over the past couple of decades of direct seeding, I found two very easy ways to do this. The trenching method and the surface method. Let's talk about that trenching method first. As the name implies, with the trenching method, we simply dig a trench about two to three inches wide to the exact depth that we want to be planting our seeds. We then sow those seeds at the bottom of the trench, covering it up with the displaced soil. Gardening literally doesn't get any easier than this. For the surface method, this one seems to work best in beds where you're already going to be adding some soil anyways. Maybe over winter that soil is sunk and you got to add some more in. Taking a nice organic potting mix, simply make a two to three inch landing pad for your seeds. 
Just spread it on loose and liberally. No need for exact measurements here. Then tap it down to make it nice and level. Go ahead and seed like you normally would and then cover up with the skim coat of that same potting mix to the appropriate depth for that crop. In both cases, once you're done covering up those seeds, a thin mulch layer and a thorough watering is in order. And really, that's it. We can now wait for the crops to sprout. Easy stuff. Almost as easy as checking out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Tomatoes, easily the number one backyard crop for new and old growers alike. It's a great feeling to take a young seedling all the way from humble beginnings to an epic harvest, no doubt. But to do so, you'll have to be virtually mistake free. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we may make mistakes, but we always learn from them. And today's episode is all about avoiding these mistakes with our tomato plants. I've got six to get through today, time short as it always is, so let's dive in. Gardening is all about the timing, and tomatoes are no different. Native to the tropical Americas, tomatoes need a certain amount of accumulated warm weather, degree days if you will, to complete their life cycle of growth, flowering, and fruiting. Planting them too late in the season without enough time to accomplish this, especially in areas with short summers, well, that's going to result in little to no harvest. As impressive as these guys are above ground, below it, even more so. Tomato root systems are vast in width as well as depth. Give them the space that they need to grow both in containers and apart from each other, plant it out in the garden or else you could have some pretty stunted harvests. Speaking of that depth, whether it's in a container like these fabric grow bags or out in the garden, tomatoes should always be planted deep. This is generally a rule for all nightshades, but especially tomatoes. This plant is the absolute king at sending out adventitious roots. Now, if you're not quite sure what they are, or maybe you've never heard the term before, Adventitious roots are stem roots that appear out of nowhere almost instantaneously whenever those stems come in contact with moist soil. Tomatoes are simply the best at it. It's why they virtually never get transplant shock. Take advantage of this growth habit and plant your tomatoes deep. Location, location, location. Tomatoes need sun. There's no way around it. Six plus hours a day of direct sunlight zero exceptions. As a large, robust plant with broad leaves, tomatoes go through a lot of water. No question, but this one's a little bit tricky to get right. In fact, watering tomatoes could be an entire video unto itself. Too little, and they'll severely underperform as they curl up just trying to survive. Too much though can be just as bad, which makes the whole thing super confusing, even to veteran growers. It all boils down to how you water. Frequent, shallow waterings cause the roots to develop near the top of the soil, giving your tomatoes no coping relief for the summer heat. Train those roots to go downwards with thorough but infrequent waterings for best results. And lastly, tomatoes need your support. Literally, even bush types like this starfire here. Determinate or indeterminate, Tomato branches and leaves are heavy, but to make matters even worse, they pale in comparison to the fruit itself. You gotta support all tomato plants, even the small grape and cherry varieties. It's not that hard. Secure the main stem to a stake or trellis at points just above the shoot axles. It has to be here to prevent any unwanted breakage of that main stem. Look, if your tomato plants are growing so well, so big that they actually need support, well, they should have it. Just like I hope you support the next episode of the Garden Quickie.
It's that time of year when gardening fever is taking over. And no other plant generates as much excitement as tomatoes do. Quite simply, the world's most popular backyard crop. And in the next few weekends, millions and millions of tomatoes will be planted in the Northern Hemisphere. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, tomatoes is literally in our name. And today's episode is all about those tomatoes. Or more specifically, tomato spacing. Why is it so important? And just how much space do tomatoes need? Hey, time short as you know it is, so let's dive in. Tomatoes are large vigorous plants, both above ground and below. They need space. But why exactly? What's the reason? Well, like most things gardening, there's a couple of reasons. First and foremost, tomatoes don't want to be competing for resources, namely water and nutrients. They don't want to compete with other plants, and they most certainly don't want to compete with themselves. For as big as their foliage can get above ground, tomatoes can spread massively below ground. And while symbiotic root relationships can exist to a degree, too many plants in too small of an area are going to suffer from a lack of resources. Another reason tomatoes need space from each other is airflow. Simply put, most plant diseases absolutely flourish like crazy in moist, dark, low airflow type conditions. Without a doubt, we need to space our tomato plants apart to give adequate air motion, as well as to allow the sunlight to dry out the previous night's dew. Otherwise, our plants could be in for a world of hurt. Okay, great, but how much space do they really need? Well, small, determinate bush type varieties like this tiny Tim here, they could probably get away with 12 inches between each plant. Although I'd advise you to go 18 inches if you can afford the space. For larger types like these Romas, stretch that spacing out to two feet between each plant. Four feet between rows if you're doing multiple. They may look tiny and sparse now, but in short order, they'll be knocking shoulders, fighting for all the resources that they can grab. If you like your tomato plants, as well as the tomatoes they produce, give them some space. And if you like garden quickies, make sure to subscribe and check out the next one. Tomatoes are a beast of a crop, and fortunately for us, they also give a beast of a harvest. But to get from something as small as its alien-like tiny seeds to the eight-foot monster plants with endless produce, well, our tomatoes are going to need a couple of boosts. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we'll give you all those boosts are free. And today's episode is all about fertilizing those tomatoes. When, how much, and what with. Time's ticking and we got a lot to cover, so let's get to it. Tomato plants, in all their forms, are often classified as heavy feeders. And while it's true they do take up a lot of nutrients over their life cycle, you shouldn't go overboard with your fertilizer. In fact, even in container setups like these two romas here, your tomatoes are only going to need to be fed twice. The first of those is either during or soon after the day you plant them. For me, I do like to fertilize around 48 to 72 hours after I plant them. But essentially, we're fertilizing at planting time to boost the plant into adulthood so that it can maximize those early stages of growth. For my containers, this works out great. But for my raised beds, which are always amended with super rich compost, I often find this feeding unnecessary. So sometimes I'll actually skip it. Which brings us to our second round of fertilizer, and that's applied when the fruit just starts to appear. The timing on this one is really key, because fertilizing too late can really mess up the tomato's taste, texture, and durability. So, 
If you miss this early window of fertilizing, well, you're better off skipping it in my opinion. Great, so our first feeding is right at planting time and then again a month or so later when that fruit begins to appear. But what do we feed with? For me, if I'm not feeding directly with my own compost, then I'm using a balanced liquid organic fertilizer. At least for that first feeding. The second one, during the fruiting stage, can really benefit from dialing down the nitrogen, or the N in your NPK ratio. At that point in the life cycle, you really don't want to be promoting excessive leaf growth. So, try to find a blend where the first number is slightly lower. That's it for tomato fertilizing. Powerful, but pretty basic stuff that'll get you results. Know what else will get you results? Checking out the next episode of The Garden Quickie. For me, nothing beats a handful of plump blueberries right off the bush. A true North American superfood that we're so lucky to call our own. Yet, it's also one of the most pricey food items in the grocery store, even without the current inflation. The best thing for us, as it always is, is to just grow our own. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, growing our own is our motto. And today's episode is all about blueberries. More specifically, Tips for planting up those brand new blueberry plants that you just bought at the store. Let's get them set up for maximum success. But we're going to have to act fast because time's short as it always is. Blueberry plants are extremely long lived. In fact, it takes them about 10 years to reach their maximum size. So we need to keep that in mind that whatever we're doing now to make our blueberry plants happy keeps them staying happy for the decades of future production to come. And this all starts with how we plant them. Now, because it's a little easier to see what we're doing, I'm gonna be planting my blueberries today in containers. Normally, blueberries are planted in the ground out in the garden, but containers are completely viable. And if you can get one big enough, it can be just as successful. If you are gonna go the container route, I suggest a minimum of a 10 gallon size. And if you're going to be planting them out in the garden, make sure to space them at least two feet apart. Having said that, one plant is going to give you some berries, sure. But two or more plants is going to give you significantly more harvests. This is because blueberry plants need buddies to max out their pollination, and thus the yields. With these guys, the more the merrier. For location, you're going to want sun, and lots of it. They need as much sun as you can give them. Six hours plus a day, more if you can afford it. Now, for the soil, it needs to be loose, well-drained, and high in organic matter. But, unlike all your other crops that enjoy this type of soil, well, these guys need it acidic. A pH of 4.5 to 5.5 works best. At the time of planting, and once per year afterwards, I sprinkle pelleted elemental sulfur on the top layer of soil. This works great to maintain that medium acidity that the blueberries require. Okay, now that we're ready to plant, we have to keep in mind that blueberries are quite shallow rooted, so this is going to be fairly easy. It should be noted that there's two key times that you can plant your blueberries early spring or early fall. I prefer the spring. First thing, gently remove your blueberry plant from the pot. After that, loosen up some of the roots as much as you can, especially if it's an older plant that might be pot bound. All shrubs, including blueberries, are very susceptible to becoming root bound in their pots. Loosen up that root ball so that the fine root system of the plant can spread out and do its thing. Observing the existing root color, go ahead and plant the blueberry bush. We're using containers today like we mentioned before, so we'll use a quality container potting mix. But if you're growing in the ground, simply backfill in with the displaced soil. Fill it up nice and level, packing it down a few times. Next, 
mulch with some fine bark or even straw, and then water thoroughly to consolidate the planting. These guys here are two-year-old cuttings from my own blueberry stalk, so they're already producing flowers. With yours, you may have to wait until the following summer to see your first fruit. In the meantime though, don't forget to tune in and watch the next episode of the Garden Quickie. There's one vegetable that we consume more than any other, and it forms the basis of so many of our sides and meals. Of course, I'm talking lettuce, that king of leafy greens that sometimes, oddly enough, gets overlooked in our backyard gardens. One thing that's impossible to overlook, though, is the price of lettuce at the store lately. Ouch. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we promise to always keep the cost down. And today's episode is all about free lettuce. More accurately, how to plant and grow your own for max harvest. Time short as it always is, so let's dive in. First up, even though you don't see it often, you can direct seed lettuce. Honestly though, I've found it to be quite uneven, quite unreliable, and a pain at best. Starter plugs rule the roost, so that's going to be our focus for today. Historically, lettuce comes in four main types or categories. Romaine, leafy, butterhead, and iceberg. While they may look radically different, they're all planted and grown much the same. At the beginning of every growing season, you can buy lettuce plugs for pretty cheap, usually less than 50 cents each. What I like to do though, is just make my own. They germinate quick and grow fast. You can even make biodegradable pots out of paper towel rolls. Germinate your favorite lettuce varieties between 70 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit and you'll have your own little lettuce plugs in no time. Either way, most lettuces are pretty cool tolerant and they can be one of the first plants to grow into the garden in the spring. Once your nighttime lows stay consistently north of 40 degrees Fahrenheit, your lettuce can safely go into the garden. Planting them this early in the spring allows us to beat the summer heat and harvest those lettuce leaves when they look and taste their best. As an added bonus, you can plant your lettuce again at the end of summer for a fall harvest that's just as nice. For location, lettuce is a full sun plant. So for best results, six plus hours a day of direct sunlight, no exceptions. And for soil, I know we say it all the time, but it does need to drain freely while simultaneously retaining moisture. This is true for most plants, but especially a lush leafy green like lettuce. So, shoot for a loose, rich, high in organic matter soil that drains freely and has a neutral pH. All right, for planting lettuce plugs, depth is super important. You always wanna plant it to the existing root color, no deeper, but also not high and dry. When I'm planting lettuce, especially if my bed may be a little dry, maybe a little lacking, I like to use a quality potting mix as I'm doing it. Instead of backfilling in with the display soil from the bed, using potting soil really helps those plugs to feel at home. It allows for quicker root growth and much less transplant shock. Moving on, if you're gonna be growing more than one lettuce plant, you need to space them about a foot apart. The upright romaine types can be squeezed in a little bit tighter at eight inches, but don't get too crazy with it. Oh, and for you container growers, a single head of lettuce should be planted in about a three gallon pot. Do try to plant on a calm, cool, overcast day and mulch and water immediately to avoid transplant shock. If you amend your beds with compost, there's no need to fertilize at this time. But if you feel that your soil is lacking, wait about a week after planting and fertilize with a liquid organic boost. And because we're growing for pure leaf growth, aim for a little bit higher in nitrogen. In about four to five weeks, 
you can start thinking about harvesting your lettuce. Now, for those upright romaine types, just take the outside leaves first in a process known as the cut and come again method. Do it this way for a near unlimited supply. Easy stuff. Almost as easy as checking out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. While many consider lettuce to be the absolute king of leafy greens, a strong case can be made for this guy, spinach, both nutritionally and with how easy it is to grow. Absolutely fortified with vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin K, magnesium, manganese, iron, folate, and even protein. In my mind, spinach is the superfood overlooked by everyone, except maybe our favorite sailor man. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we'll gladly pay you Tuesday for bucket loads of spinach today. And this episode is all about cultivating that spinach. Sowing, growing, maintaining, and harvesting. Time short as it always is, so let's get going. Now, you may have heard this before, but spinach is what we call a quick crop. Seed to harvest, these guys are ready in a maximum of six weeks. Cold and warm tolerant varieties exist, so as long as you're above freezing, you can grow spinach. These guys are always direct seeded, and the seed packets can be had for pretty cheap, sometimes as low as a buck. If you're gonna be growing lots, set up your spinach rows to be spaced eight to 12 inches apart. For the actual planting, sow your spinach seeds shallow, roughly a half inch deep, and a half inch apart. I sow mine heavily though, so experiment with different densities and see how that affects your harvests. Just note however, grown too dense and you'll get airflow problems which can attract pests and disease. But too far apart? Well, and it's kind of a waste of space. I sow them thicker because they can always be thin later. Now, you have to keep the soil moist during germination to allow that initial taproot to not only anchor the young seedlings, but to also help the plants uptake the moisture. And the nutrients. Spinach grows fast, so it's gonna burn through those elements, minerals, and compounds pretty quick. Most growers fertilize this crop with a nitrogen heavy application, and no doubt the plants will use it. But if you have a rich soil to begin with, and you regularly amend with some of your compost, you can likely skip fertilizing your spinach. If not though, and you think the plants need a little extra, use a liquid organic blend that skews slightly higher in nitrogen. Apply it about two weeks after germination, a week or so after the first true leaves appear. That's it, just feed them once. As the plants get older, excessive heat or stress will cause your spinach to flower or bolt. Do note that once the plant does this, it's done. We need to be harvesting those spinach leaves before it goes to flower. Fortunately, we can harvest spinach at any time. Simply cut those leaves down, roll them in some paper towel, and throw them in the fridge. Surprisingly, as long as you don't bruise them in the process, it can stay fresh like this for upwards of two weeks. Amazing. Spinach, an ultimate leafy quick crop not to be missed this season. Just like you shouldn't miss the next episode of the Garden Quickie. There's fast crops, there's quick crops. And then there's radishes. Seed to sprout, root to harvest in about a month. It's quite astonishing and really one of those things that you need to grow to believe. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show we're in two minutes or less. It's almost enough time to grow a crop of radishes. And today's episode is all about that king of quick crops, planting, maintaining, and harvesting. Let's cover it all. Time short as it always is, so let's get going. Not commonly known to a lot of people, but radishes are actually a brassica, 
And interestingly enough, they can be either an annual or a biennial. However, you're going to be harvesting those bulbous taproots long before any flowers appear. If you're scouting out locations, radishes are a full sun crop. Plant them where they're going to get at least six plus hours a day of direct sunlight. Also, as a root crop, they enjoy a loose soil free of stones, debris, or any impediments. Throughout that amazing, albeit short life cycle, make sure to keep your radishes well watered. But never soggy or standing in pools of water. Like every other crop out there, drainage really is the key. For planting, direct seeding is obviously how we're going to be growing these guys. And they can be planted throughout the year multiple times, as long as the soil temperatures stay above 50 degrees Fahrenheit. With radishes, you want to sow them shallow, no more than about an inch deep. And if you're doing many, keep your rows at least a foot apart. Like carrots and beets, radishes are sown heavy and then thin later. Don't skip out on that step though. If they're not thinned and they become too crowded, radishes simply won't produce that bulbous taproot. So, to make sure that we give them the space they need, use a clean pair of scissors or your fingers if you want to, and simply cut or pull up the unwanted plants. The ideal spacing for radishes is about an inch between each plant. You don't have to be exact though, just use it as a guideline. I find that radishes are best thinned once they get their first set of true leaves, about five to six days after germination. Again, don't leave it too long or you're going to jeopardize that harvest. Even though they're a vigorous grower, I don't normally fertilize my radishes. They just grow so quickly and that cycle is over before you know it. So I don't find fertilizing all that necessary. However, if you feel you have to due to poor soil or some nutrient deficiencies, simply use a balanced liquid organic boost roughly two weeks after germination. Just that one application at the midpoint of the cycle should be enough. Even though radishes are a root crop, that bulbous taproot grows right at the surface. Size is your clue to harvest, so keep an eye on them and don't leave them in the ground too long. Most varieties taste the best when they're just below golf ball size. Also, those leafy tops are totally edible as well, although they're best eaten when the plants are quite young. For an added bonus, grow your radishes near beans, beets, cucumbers, lettuce, mint, peas, spinach, squash, and tomatoes as the perfect companion. And for the perfect companion video, make sure to check out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Thanks for watching guys. And hey, if Garden Quickies are your thing, be sure to click on this playlist here as we explore and solve more growing issues in two minutes or less.